For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. Just as God brought light into creation on day one in Genesis 1, in the New Testament, he brings light into the hearts of those in spiritual darkness. God has entrusted his children to carry the glorious and divine message of Christ through salvation. This reveals the powerful message of forgiveness through Christ's sacrifice and contrasts common jars of clay carrying the good news. These jars represent you and me. Jars of clay in Jesus' time were imperfect vessels with cracks and leaks, but they were still usable for their purpose. Today, we are his jars of clay. In spite of our sinfulness, brokenness, and challenges, God still uses his children to deliver the gospel of his son, Jesus. Redeemed people, imperfections and all, delivering the timeless message of Christ. Only God could come up with a storyline like that. Grace Valley Church exists to help people find the grace of Jesus in the valleys of life. Hey, good morning, Grace Valley Church. Stand to your feet. How you doing this morning? Hey, if you're watching online, thank you so much for being here. Let's go. Come on. i 
Good morning and welcome to Grace Valley Church. Um, Happy New Year. We are excited to be starting two services today. So if you're watching online or here with us in person, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, A couple of things. First off is... uh, we're going to welcome each other. So uh, do the COVID welcome, wave from afar, and uh, take 20 seconds, 30 seconds, and say hi to the people around you. A couple of things before we uh, continue in worship. Um, We are actually uh, moving towards uh, starting small groups back up. Now, they will be um, COVID sensitive, uh, but if you are interested in leading a small group here at Grace Valley, um, if you would meet me after the service right here, um, we'll have a quick meeting um, and, and just let you know what that looks like. Uh, But if you are interested in leading a small group here at Grace Valley, please meet me here afterwards. We're excited about getting those started back up. Um, Also, uh, Andy is starting a new service, uh, a new (laughs) service, a new uh, series. Um, uh, We are starting a new service, um, but he's starting a new series today. We're really excited about titled Grace Flows Down. Um, So uh, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, And uh, Youth Tonight starts back today, um, tonight from five to seven. Uh, and we also are starting youth small groups back up this week as well. Um, if you have a 6th through 12th grader uh, that would be interested in those, uh, those two events, please see me afterwards or you can email me um, and I can get you information on that. Uh, it's been a tough week. Um, there's a, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't say there's a lot of sadness um, that I think we're all feeling about um, what's going on in, in our country. And so uh, I think today is important. Um, It's important for us to hone in um, and really focus on God's word and and just worship to our fullest. Um, So to get us uh, uh, going back into worship, let's pray together and then then we'll worship together. God, I thank you for uh, everyone here. I thank you for, um, God, your word and and the ability that we have to um, freely study it and learn from you knowing that um, you know what's to come. You know what we're walking through. You know what's going on in this world. And God, your hand is on it. So God, uh, help us to remember that you're walking through these valleys with us. And God, may your word be spoke, spoken through Andy today. And may we worship you with all that we have. In your name I pray. Amen. sing this next song with us. Well, I searched the world But it couldn't fill me And man's empty praise And treasures the fade I'm never Yeah. Hey. 
Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more.
faithfulness is true and we're desperate for your presence all we need is you waiting here for you Grace, unmerited favor, the gift of good when bad is deserved. It's the one thing that makes everything better. Imperfect people in an imperfect world need grace to be able to live past failures, mistakes, and missteps. Grace is the gift of freedom to be yourself and the invitation to keep growing and getting better. Grace is the only way we sinful people can have a relationship with a holy God. God's grace is like a river. It flows down to the valley of your need, your failure, and your imperfection.
Well, good morning. Thanks for <clears throat> being here in person for the first Sunday we've had. Uh, we're having two services, and we'll continue this. Um, and thanks for joining us online. And this new series, I'm really excited about it because I really think it is going to uh, bring us back to some of the foundational truths, uh, not only for Christian faith, but for um, our church specifically. And uh, so I want to ask you to open your Bibles to Romans chapter 3. That's in the New Testament. If you're not familiar with the Bible, uh, r- roughly the last third of your Bible um, is the New Testament. The rest is the Old Testament. We're going to be in the New Testament in the book of Romans. Um, so it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the book of Acts, then the book of Romans. So you can make your way to chapter 3. <clears throat> and I want to ask you a question. And you please don't answer out loud. What is your greatest failure in life so far? I want you to think about that. I know it's a very uncomfortable question, um, and for some of you, your failure is so bad, you just don't even think about it anymore. And, but I want you to think about it. I want you to think about your worst failure, and I want you to think of it not just in terms of the failure that some people may know about. I'm talking about the worst thing, the worst thing you've ever thought, the worst thing you've ever done. I just want you to think about that. What is the worst failure so far in your life? And now I want you to imagine... What if your greatest failure was broadcast to the world so everyone knew? And not just the fact that you failed, but what if it was the worst possible version of your failure? Just imagine you have no control over what is said or how you are represented. All your attempts to be honest about what really happened, how sorry you are, how much you've repented, all of that falls on deaf ears. And the story just gets out of control. Imagine people you thought were your friends, Christian people, choosing to share their opinions about you on social media just to boost their own social media platform. Imagine the people close to you keeping their distance because they're so afraid that your failure is going to tarnish their reputation. Imagine that you are so confused that you can't tell the difference between those people who call themselves your friends and those people who call themselves your enemies. Imagine how you would feel. And imagine that all this is recorded online so that it will never truly go away. How would you feel? I think deep down, we can all... Imagine ourselves in that worst possible situation. Uh, Believe it or not, I think I can kind of relate to this scenario. (laughs) And the truth is, here's the the reality. We all know that we're not perfect. We all know that we're failures. In fact, we all really, if we were truly honest, we would admit that we are awful sinners. Even though we don't want people to know it, even though we do everything in our power to control our image and to make sure people think we're good and we're right and all those things. And as much as we love to say we have nothing to hide, the truth is we all kind of do have something to hide. And if it were to get out, oh my goodness, the fear that grips us over that thought. And the idea that if you found yourself in those shoes, the one thing you would want I think I can speak to this. The one thing you would want is grace. You would want grace. From God, for sure, from God, for the wrong that you know you've done, hoping that God's forgiveness will cover your sin and give you a a new future, and grace from everybody else, everybody who wants to pounce on your failure. That's kind of the world we live in these days. We live in a world that is divided in several ways, not just two ways, but in several ways, but for sure at least two ways here in the good old U.S. of A. And if you don't follow the rules of this side, well, the other side's going to crucify you, cancel you, destroy you. And then if you don't line up with that side, the other side, well, they're going to crucify you, cancel you, destroy you. That is the world we live in. We live in a world terribly absent of grace. But it's the one thing we all need because the one thing we can't get away from is this common ground we all share. We are sinners. We are utter failures. 
And it just happens to, to be the case that we use other people's failures as the distraction away from ours. You ever feel yourself doing that? It's why we feel so empowered on social media to mouth off about everything. Because if we can talk about that, no one's talking about this. No one's talking about me. So we really need to get back to the basics of grace. See, there was a guy one time who thought grace was so good, he wrote a song. And he described grace as amazing. If it's so amazing, why do we have such a hard time giving it to other people? If it's so amazing, why do we have such a hard time believing that God has actually given it to us? And why? This is the big one for me. If it's amazing, why do we have such a hard time believing that God would give it to other people other than us? Because here's the truth. If God's grace has saved and redeemed me, I assure you, his grace can save and redeem you. So Romans chapter 3 gets us into this whole topic of grace and this, this common ground we share in sinfulness. And it really is the, the basis of this church because uh, a little over a year ago, we started Grace Valley Church on this idea that we want to be a church, a group of people, and not just an organization, but a group of people who have experienced the grace of God so much so that we wish to give it to other people. We wish to help other people find the same grace of Jesus in their valley of life. And I remain convinced that more people are in a valley than are not in a valley. And you know without going, you don't have to do seven degrees of Kevin Bacon to find out there are some people in your life that you know very well that are in a valley right now, and it might be you. And some of you have been through enough of a valley where God has met you in the valley, where his grace has been there for you in some way, that you now are so grateful for God's grace that you can't imagine a life where you aren't helping other people. And that's really the genesis of our church, is that we would be a place full of people who are journeying through the valley of their life, or we are walking with people in the valley. We are a place, a safe place, I hope, where you can be honest about your struggles, where you can find the grace of Jesus in the midst of your own sin, and that for those of us who've been there before, we can be there for you, knowing that we'll probably be there again, and we may need you to be there for us again. And so this is uh, the kind of series for me, uh, there's, there's very few things as close to my heart as the subject of grace. I would go so far as to say, I think it's the most important topic in the Bible. Because it not only describes a doctrine, a, a thing we believe in as Christians, part of, our, uh, part of our theology, it describes God himself. He's a God of grace. And so we really need to get our bearings and our understanding around what grace is. Because I will tell you, I think all of us have misunderstandings in our mind about grace. We're not fully on page with what God talks about when he refers to his grace and what grace really is. And so I want to uh, start by exposing two of the ways we, we really misunderstand grace. And the first is we view grace through a lens of license. And some of you have thought about this. If you've been a Christian a long time, you are very aware of this struggle that we have. Because we see God and understand that God truly is a God of grace and forgiveness, there's a part of us that sort of feels the freedom to sort of take advantage of that. Like, okay, well, I can keep sinning and God will still forgive me. That's called license. We see God's grace as a license to get away with whatever we want to get away with. I will tell you that is a misunderstanding of God's grace. Some people refer to that as abusing grace. Now, I understand why we use that phrase, but I want to tell you why I don't like that phrase. Because it sort of conjures up this idea that we have the ability to abuse the God of the universe. And I really don't think we're able to. In fact, if you go back and look at the account of Jesus giving his life on the cross when he's arrested and tried and ultimately crucified, he tells his disciples, no one takes my life from me. I lay my life down willingly. See, nobody stole anything from God. Nobody stole anything from Jesus. No one can in that way abuse God. God is above all of that. God willingly sacrificed himself for us. However, there is this attitude we get where we see our lives sometimes as this struggle where we say, well, if I can, I'll just do this one more time. I know God will forgive me and it'll be okay. 
Now, here's the tricky part with that. That's kind of true. But it still goes against the grain of what grace is, which we'll talk about here in a little while. But some of us misunderstand grace by thinking grace is licensed to get away with whatever we want to get away with. On the flip side, the other way we misunderstand grace is we view grace through this lens of unworthiness, shame, or guilt. This idea that we'll never be able to measure up. So some of you have grown up thinking that if you are just a really good person, if you can just measure up to God, to his standard, then God will accept you based on how good you are. The problem with that is, and the reason why it feels like a treadmill is because that is a treadmill. You can never be good enough for God, and that's the struggle. We'll talk about that in today's text. But the struggle we have is we think, okay, I have to somehow earn God's grace or pay him back for all this good thing that he's done. And the problem is you just feel this overwhelming sense of shame and guilt because you can never seem to outrun the big problem. You. You can't outrun your own sin. You can't outrun your own failure. I had this uh, person right after the first service come to me and said, um, here's a good description of, gr- of grace and the difference between grace and mercy. We were singing about mercy earlier. He said, the difference between grace and mercy. Mercy is when the cop pulls you over and doesn't give you the ticket you deserve. That's mercy. You know, police officer, please have mercy on me, right? My right foot was a little heavy today. You know, have mercy on me. But grace is when the cop pulls you over, doesn't give you the ticket, and gives you a gift card to Gus's Fried Chicken. I thought, yeah, that's more like it. That's great. Isn't that grace? That's what God has done. God has not only held back his righteous judgment on us, his righteous condemnation of us, which we deserved, he went beyond that. He gave us a great gift of his love and forgiveness and peace in our lives. So this is mission critical for us to understand what grace truly is. And so if you have your Bibles open to Romans chapter 3, I want to uh, talk a little bit about what I'm calling the grace reality. And the first thing I want you to write down, oh, by the way, let me talk about notes real quick. Um, I shared this with the first service. This is a journal, and I'm a big journal guy. I, I like to take notes. I like to, in my quiet time each day, I like to read some scripture and then I'll, I'll write thoughts and prayers and insights I gain from that scripture. And I am really convinced, maybe more after this last week than ever, that we are reaching a point in our lifetime where being a Christian is going to become a, a greater challenge than it ever has been in our lifetime. It's nothing new under the sun, by the way. There were, there's been lots of seasons in history where being a Christian invited challenge. It invited attack. It invited uh, some sort of resistance. And so forever, Christians have had to decide, will their convictions be strong enough to face those challenges? Will their faith be strong enough to face those challenges? Or will their faith crumble during those times? And I really think the difference is how connected we are to the truth of God's word. Well, here's my problem. When I read the Bible, particularly in my morning quiet time, I'll read the Bible. I used to try to pull it off. I was trying to be cool and hip and technological, and I'm reading the Bible on my phone. Within seconds, I'm in my email. And that's my problem. That's my personality. I'm just so sort of task-driven. I jump into my, my work day. So the journaling has become the way I sort of remedy that. I slow my life down and get out a pen and paper and I write prayers. I write my thoughts and it keeps me focused and it brings me back to God's truth. And so I want to really encourage our church this year that we would be people who are in pursuit of, of anchoring our lives in the truth of God's word, not just in what Andy says, please. Guys, I try really hard to say the right things and represent God's truth appropriately, but I'm a flawed human being too. So it, I can mess up. I try not to, but I can mess up. You need to be able to read God's word for yourself and gain from his truth. So we want to equip you to do that. And so uh, we have these journals made. They have the little uh, Grace Valley cross on the front. And if you would like one, they're free for you. They cost about $10. If you would like to donate $10 to cover the cost for them, that would be great. Now, because they're free, they're on the back table. All you have to do is go pick one up. That means please leave some for everyone. Don't go get 14 journals go free some of y'all hear free and you think buffet you're like oh yeah i'm loading them up i'm taking these with me no share let's be friendly and share but if you would like a journal we'd like to give you one so that you can uh hopefully enhance your 
um, your time with the Lord, and maybe even you can put some of the notes, things like we talk about in sermons, you can track that stuff and grow. So all that to say, write this down. <laughs> that was a great transition, wasn't it? Sin disabled us. So when Paul jumps into this topic about grace, he starts breaking down this whole reality in which grace was introduced to us. And so the first thing is that sin disabled us. Look in verse 9. Paul says, what shall we conclude then? Are we any better? And he answers his own question, not at all. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away, and they have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. So Paul is actually bringing us into a conversation that was very relevant in his day, which was this division between two groups of people. Can we relate? And the division was, if you were Jewish, if you grew up under Judaism, you were born into the law, is what they say, meaning the law of Moses, you were under this understanding that you were God's people. And then there's this other group of people called the Gentiles. That would be everyone else who isn't Jewish. Okay, so unless you're Jewish in this room today or watching online, you're a Gentile for all of the discussion purposes for this, this sermon. So Jews and Gentiles. Jews had this idea that because I was born Jewish, I am automatically accepted by God. I will, I will go to heaven when I die. I will receive salvation. I will be acceptable to God because I am Jewish. And Paul goes on the attack. Now, understand this. Paul is Jewish. So Paul is saying, what shall we conclude then? Are we, meaning Jews, are we any better? He says, not at all. We have already made the charge, made the claim that Jews and Gentiles are all alike. We all have common ground. And where are we? Where's our common ground? In our sinfulness. So Paul brings us into this reality that sin has disabled all of us. And this is the first step of understanding grace, is understanding how badly we have missed the mark, how bad off we are. Now, I want to just dive into this because sometimes we get this wrong impression of, of goodness or righteousness. He says here, as it is written, he's quoting one of the prophets from the Old Testament, no one is righteous, not even one. And we fall into that trap, don't we? We think from, for whatever reason, we have have some background, we have some experience, we have something that sets us apart and makes us more acceptable to God. And maybe for you it's going to church every week, or maybe you've given money to the church, or you have read your Bible a lot, or you've memorized Bible verses. Whatever it is you think sets you apart, makes you better, Paul would say, you are not better because of those things. In fact, Paul goes so far to quote the Old Testament, says, there's no one righteous. No, not one. But isn't that our tendency to think that, okay, God is good, and if I'm good and God is good, then maybe I'll be acceptable to God. So here's the problem. Sometimes we think um, in terms of sin being a mistake. Haven't we all said it? Like, oh, you know, you know I made a mistake. I'm only human. We say those things sometimes. I want to tell you, there's a huge difference between admitting that you are sinful and, and admitting that you've made a mistake. Making a mistake is certainly human. It's part of the, the human experience. We make mistakes. We fall short. We, we make bad decisions. We all make mistakes. But the reason why that's different than admitting that you're sinful is because admitting you're sinful means going beyond the decisions or choices that you've made and admitting that somehow you are unrighteous at your core, in your soul, that you are misaligned with God even beyond your choices. And that is a huge step to understand. Some of you have grown up in church and you've never heard this. Some of you have just grown up with the idea of thinking that if, if I make less bad choices than the next guy, then I'm better off. And I'm just telling you, God looks at us and, and says, you are sinful at your very core. So before you ever made a bad decision, you were already sinful. So that we are both sinner in choice and we are sinner in nature. And that is, that is vital to our understanding. That is what Paul is trying to uproot and, and dismantle here. Is this idea that somehow there is something you can do as a human being. Something you can do in your choices. Something you can do in your own effort and righteousness to somehow earn God's favor. You can't do it. There is no one who's righteous. And I love how he says this. 
He says, no, no one who understands, no one who seeks God. That is our reality. We are not that good. And he says, all have turned away. They have together become worthless. There's no one who does good, not even one. There's a reality that we're sinful, and consequently, there's nothing in us that understands God or seeks him on our own. That's a struggle in us. That's our reality. So we have to understand, before we fully understand grace, we have to understand how disabling sin has been in our lives. So number two, Paul continues, and he says, verse 19, now that we know, uh, excuse me, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. So this second thing I want you to write down, the law discloses us. Now, Paul, he was a Jewish man. And he understands the law of Moses, which is the Old Testament in our Bible, okay? He understood the law of Moses, particularly the first five books that contained all the specific elements of the law. But every Jewish person in the first century understood we are sons and daughters of Moses. We are, we are under the Mosaic law, and they took a lot of pride in that, that we're going to follow the Ten Commandments plus the 630-something other commands that go with that. We're going to try to be people who follow the law. And so... Paul goes into this and says, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. In other words, we're accountable to the law of God. It is above us. The problem is we often think that if I just obey the law, it will result in me being righteous and therefore acceptable to God. So write this down. Don't miss this. This is vital information. You heard it here first. The law particularly the Ten Commandments and all the other stuff, none of that was ever meant to produce salvation. Some people think that. I'll, all I have to do is obey the Ten Commandments and God will accept me. False. That is not true. The law, on the other hand, serves a different purpose. Paul tells us what it is in verse 20. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight, in God's sight, by observing the law. Doesn't get more plain than that. No one will be declared righteous in God's eyes by following all the rules. The hint, the secret in that is because nobody can fully follow the rules. They represent the standard of perfection. They, st they represent the character and the nature of God. No one is able to fulfill the law on their own. So no one will be declared righteous by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. The law becomes like a mirror showing us how sinful we are. Now, i got to share with you a little bit about this midlife crisis I have entered into. So, I turned 45 in the last year. And I know some of you are like, midlife, yeah, right. All right, seriously, my son is 16. He comes bebopping in one day. He says, I want to start working out. Well, see, you guys know. I'm like a CrossFit guy. And some of you cyclists who know me, no, I cycle some, but I'm, I'm down in my heart. I'm a CrossFit guy. For over a decade, I have been doing CrossFit. I can lift a lot of heavy weight. I can crunch through workouts. I'm, I'm a CrossFit guy. So my son says, I want to play this game. I want to get involved in CrossFit. So I said, okay, cool. I'll start training. I'll start showing you the ropes. He got some of his buddies together. They're coming to work out. Okay, see, a line was crossed. He comes home one day and says, Dad, I beat you in the workout. Ooh, that hurts, man. If you've not had teenagers, you dads out there, there's something in a dad. It's our job is to hold the top line. Our job is to maintain control. Our job is to hold our thumb over them boys, make sure they know who's boss. Well, this, this got me, man. So I said, okay, I can't let this happen. So I started turning up the intensity on my own workouts. I'm going to keep up with him. You know what I learned? I am not 16. <laughs> Man, we can do the exact same workout. I can keep up with him. I can beat him some. But the next day, whew, it is not good. It is not good. These teenagers, they come in there, they bounce back like it didn't even happen. 
It takes me three days. I'm hobbling around, sore, complaining. He's like, Dad, we want to work out again today. I'm like, you idiot. <laughs> so I was reading this text this week, and I was like, my son is like a mirror to where I have come, to this reality that I'm not what I was. Much as I want to think about how tough I was in the old days, the reality is I'm not what I was. And his, his working out and all his stuff is like just a mirror facing me all the time. And that's what the law is for us. When we read the truth of God's word, do you know what it is? It's a mirror showing us how sinful we are, reminding us that we don't truly measure up. In fact, it shows us that no matter how good we think we are, all of our effort still leaves us short. We never fully measure up to God. And that ought to create some apprehension in us, some fear, some struggle, and go, oh, then how can I ever be acceptable to God? It should make you ask that question. This idea that somehow we can be good enough and earn God's favor and somehow please God on our own. I hope that this message will t- completely destroy that thinking in your life. You cannot be good enough for God, period. And until you embrace that very bad news, you will never truly receive the good news of God's grace. And so Paul goes on. In verse 21, he says, But now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known. Okay, we're talking about good news now. To which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. Jew or Gentile, there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. So where sin disables us and the law discloses us, it reveals who we are truly. It's like the mirror showing us who we really are. Here, grace delivers us. So now the grace of God is where our deliverance comes from. And so here he says, a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known. So this is our struggle. The the reality that the law shows us is that we don't measure up. The hopelessness of not measuring up should cause us to look at God and say, what can I do? And then then God reveals a righteousness from God apart from the law, not by obeying the law, separate from the law, has been made known. And that is the righteousness that comes through faith in Christ Jesus to all who believe. That is grace. That God would make a way for sinful people like you and me who could never measure up on our own that we could have a way to be accepted by God. But it doesn't come from our effort. It comes through Jesus Christ. So the law was designed to reveal two things, the depth of our sin and the deliverance of our Savior. It's interesting. If you want to flip to it, you can. It should be on the screens. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says these words. He says, Do not think that I have come to abolish or take away the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but I have come to fulfill them. So this is Jesus talking about the Old Testament. He's saying, I've not come to take away all this history, all this law, all these things that have been written for your benefit. I've not, I've not come to take that away. I've come to actually fulfill it. Now, for years, I read that and I always thought, I guess that means that, that Jesus is the fulfillment of it, meaning like a, like a prophetic thing, like all the prophecies about a, a Messiah that would one day come, Jesus was the answer to all those promises. And I think part of that's true. But that's not what really, not what Jesus is getting at here. Jesus is specifically talking about righteousness. He says, I've not come to abolish the law, like take it away. And that's what we like to think. We like to think if all the rules and laws were removed, then we would suddenly be righteous, right? Because now we don't have anything to to measure us by. Which is why, by the way, um, we all prefer a world that we can play by our own rules. We all prefer a world where we can define our own truth. That's con- very convenient. And that's why in our culture today, you will hear lots and lots and lots of talk about my truth or about my way or about th- this is what I see it as. And, and th- those things 
our, our way of trying to kind of change the rules or move the rules or kind of come out from under the law. Well, of, of course, that would be wonderfully convenient if we could take away all the rules. That's called anarchy. <laughs> But instead, Jesus says, I've not come to take away the law. The law serves a wonderful, graceful purpose of showing us our sin. Doesn't sound like it's a graceful purpose, but it is. It shows us our sin, so he can't take away that law. The law, we need the law to show us the reality of who we are. But he says here, but now I've come to fulfill it. So what did Jesus do? Jesus fulfilled the law by being the only one who has ever truly been righteous. So the law provides a mirror showing us our sin, and the law, fulfilled through Christ, shows us a clear picture of righteousness. So that when we place our faith in Christ, we can do so with confidence knowing he was righteous for us so that he could take our place and offer us salvation so that he could give us his grace. One of the great questions of the, of the Bible is why did Jesus have to die? Because if you're God, if you think about it, if you were God, couldn't you just sort of just sort of wave your hand and go, everyone's forgiven? Couldn't you do that? That would be really great too, right? If just God just, just everybody's okay. The problem with that is God had already set the rules. And the rules were there's a penalty for sin. For everyone who has sinned and doesn't meet God's standard, the penalty is that you have to die as a consequence. And if God just erased all that, then he would be the liar. Well, God doesn't tell lies, so God has to uphold the consequences of the law. But God has also made a way, and that way is through sacrifice, so that unrighteousness can be covered. Now, I'm going to take you way back. Remember back when we talked about the Old Testament, we were doing all the kind of famous Bible stories about Joseph and Adam and Eve and uh, the Tower of Babel, and we, and we talked about Noah and the ark. You guys remember the story of Noah and the ark? And I was teaching that last summer, and we talked about how God was giving all the instructions to Noah about how to build the boat, how long, how wide, how tall, all those things. And then he says at the end, he says, I want you to cover the hull of the boat, the part that's going to be between the boat and the water. I want you to cover that pitch or tar. And we all know immediately, we go, okay, I guess that's what made it waterproof and that's what allowed it to float. And you would be exactly right on that point. That word for pitch or tar, translated into Greek, translated into English, is the word atonement. So we look in verse 25 of Romans 3, it says, God presented Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. That word atonement means covering. That's why God used that term for Noah. It's to cover the boat by covering the boat, it would float and provide salvation. And here, applied to Jesus, the atonement of Jesus, the covering of Jesus, is that the righteous one, the only one who could do this, who could pull this off, because he did not deserve death on his own, he willingly gave his life for you and me as the righteous one, so that his blood shed on the cross would be a covering for you and me. Here's the good news. Because of the grace of Jesus, when we come to him in faith believing in something we can't see, we receive his grace, the covering, this atonement covers us so that now we stand righteous before God. I had a friend one time, he used to love to talk about how he would share the gospel with people and he loved to ask this question. He would tell people, if you had to stand before God today and tell him why he should let you into his heaven, what would you say? I always thought that was kind of a cool question. One day we're going to stand before God and Almighty God is going to say, why should I let you into my heaven? Do you know what most people would say? They would appeal to God. They would say, well, I've tried to live a good life. I tried to help people. I tried to do good. We would start lining up all our goodness. The problem is we already know the truth. Nobody's really good. No one is truly righteous. So none of that works. Here's the cool part. If you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, and his grace, the atonement of his blood, has covered your sin. When you stand before God one day, he will not see the long list of bad things you've done. He will see the righteousness of Christ covering you. He will not see your sin because he sees the righteousness of Christ covering you. It doesn't make you less of a sinner. It means you're covered. It means your sin has been covered by the blood 
of the Lamb of God. That is why Jesus had to die. He was the only one who was righteous enough to die as a sacrifice. Everyone else, we can't die for other people's sins because if we die for our sins, that's a just death. We've earned that, that consequence, so we can't pass that on. Only Jesus was righteous enough to do that. That's why Paul says, a righteousness apart from the law has been made known. Now, our only way to find righteousness is by faith in Christ. So, this morning, I want to give you an opportunity to recalibrate your life around grace. This free gift of God. This gift in light of something you could never earn, something you could never pay for, something you could never find on your own. God has given the gift of his grace. Grace is a gift freely given to people who do not deserve it, who cannot earn it, and cannot ever pay him back. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And some of you today, hearing this message, you would say, Andy, I have never really understood what it means to place my faith in Christ. Maybe your thought on that was, it, it's just a way to, faith in Christ maybe just felt like a religion to you or just a, uh, an association with the things of God. But really, faith in Christ is believing that Christ died for you and that his blood covers your sin. So it starts with that great painful admission. Jesus, I am a hopeless sinner in your eyes. I am not and cannot be righteous on my own. And by faith, God, I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin and cover me with your righteousness. Would you be willing to pray that prayer today? If you've never prayed that prayer, if you've never entered into a personal relationship with Christ by faith, I want to give you an opportunity to do that today. Right where you're seated, if that's you, if you would say, Andy, that's me. Maybe at home, you're watching online and you've never placed your faith in Christ. Maybe today is the day you receive the gift of grace. Say a prayer that goes like this. Say, dear Jesus, I admit I am a sinner and I am hopelessly separated from God. Jesus, I can never be good enough on my own. So Jesus, today, by faith, I believe that you died on the cross for me and you rose from the dead to prove that my sins are forgiving, forgiven and I've been given eternal life with God. Jesus, I declare my only righteousness comes from you. If you prayed that prayer, tell him thank you for saving me. And if you'd be so bold today, I want to invite you. We're going to have a response team down front today. On either side of the stage here, you can come down and talk with someone. We had someone share that they received Christ uh, this morning in our first service. If that's you, if you want to learn more about what it means to follow Christ and how to take the step, those steps in your journey of faith, I want to invite you to come down and talk to one of our response team members. Just tell them, hey, I prayed the prayer, and they will take it from there. If you're watching at home and you prayed that prayer, I want to invite you to uh, email us. You can simply send an email and say, I prayed the prayer to prayer at gracevalleymemphis.org. It would be our, an opportunity for us to follow up with you and help you take those steps in your journey. For the rest of us, this is a great opportunity just to be grateful for the grace of God in our lives. So I'm going to pray and then we're going to sing together and have a time of response. God, we love you and thank you for this morning in the way that your grace truly has flowed down to us. God, I pray that anyone in this room who has never placed their faith in Christ, that you would give them the courage to do that today, that you would draw them to yourself today. Pray that for those at home watching online. God, we are so grateful that you made a way for sinners like us. So we worship you in Jesus' name. Will you stand and worship with us? Amazing grace How sweet the sound Amazing love Now flowing
going to sing that again. Join in with us. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Amazing love, now flowing down from hands and feet that were nailed to the tree. His grace flows down. Sing that verse one more time. Amazing grace. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Amazing love. Now flowing down. From hands and feet. That would nail to the tree. His grace flows down. Covers me. It covers me. It covers me. It covers me. It covers me. One more time. Covers me. It covers me. It covers me. It covers me. It covers me. You guys can have a seat for just a moment. Uh, make a couple of closing announcements, and uh, thank you to the worship team for leading us today. Um, and thank you for joining us uh, for the first day and two services, and thanks for uh, flexing with that and helping make that possible so that we can make sure uh, there's plenty of room in it for everyone to worship in a safe way and an opportunity to give our kids a little more space to be able to do what they're doing. So I know uh, your kids are having a lot of fun back there, and you'll be able to pick them up in just a moment. But um, if you, at your seat, have not ever filled out this information card, this is how we get to know you. So if you wouldn't mind filling that out, if you've never have, and drop it in one of the black boxes as you leave. Uh, you can also register a prayer request on there so that we can know how to pray for you. And we take those prayer requests seriously. We pray over every single prayer request. Uh, I do take that very seriously. So please uh, drop those in the black boxes at the doors before you leave. And if you also, you can drop your offering in those black boxes as well. If you came prepared to give today uh, uh, in person, you can do that. Uh, we also make electronic giving um, and giving online available. You can just go to gra uh, gracevalleymemphis.org slash give, uh, and you can set up electronic giving that way, uh, especially if you're watching uh, from home. You can participate in our offering that way. Uh, don't forget on your way out, uh, be sure and pick up one of your journals. They're back in the very back, my left, it'll be, yeah. Your left as you're leaving, yes, in the left. Um, so you can pick up your journal again. Um, they're $10 if you want to uh, donate towards uh, just covering the cost of those. That'd be great. You can just drop $10 in the, uh, in the black boxes. Uh, if, that's, if, there's, if $10 is a barrier for anybody, just take the journal and run. Okay, it's okay. Um, we want you to be able to have the benefit of the books. A um, couple things coming up. Um, we are going to be uh, answering the question a lot of people have asked. How do we join Grace Valley Church? How do we become a member of Grace Valley Church? We are going to be hosting a series of meetings called Discover Grace Valley. Those are going to be hosted uh, for at least as long as we can at our house. Uh, the first one's going to be on January 31st. The second will be on February 21st. We'll, we'll do these periodically to give everyone a chance to be able to attend one. Um, Obviously, uh, they're going to fill up, and we'll just keep scheduling them throughout the year. Um, the goal for that would be for you to be able to come, learn more about the church, ask 
your questions and get some questions answered, that kind of thing. And then we are going to make sure that everyone who wants to be part of the Grace Valley family is uh, in a relationship with what we're calling a shepherd. There are some uh, men and women in the life of our church who are going to uh, serve as in the role of shepherd in our, in our church body just to be able to stay connected with you uh, throughout the weeks and years that you're a part of this church and, and just help lead and guide and be a, uh, a resource for you. And so uh, we're really excited about kicking that off this year. So if you would like to, that information is in the email that was sent to you uh, this morning. If you don't get that email, fill out the card. But um, there's also information you can uh, send to Nikki at gracevalleymemphis.org and we will get you signed up. Uh, again, those two dates are uh, January 31st and February 21st. Uh, we're looking forward to ha having those meetings with you. Don't forget, uh, you can meet Jake right here after the service if you are interested in leading a small group. Um, we are uh, doing our best to sort of regroup on the small group um, effort and get you plugged in. So if you would like to lead a small group or you have questions about that, come see Jake. If you're a student, middle school, high schooler, or you're a parent of a middle school or high school and you've not met Jake yet, you need to come meet Jake, learn about the student ministry, youth ministry stuff that we're doing, um, and they're meeting also tonight at 5. And last thing, we put these little cards in a little package on your chair. This is so that you can invite a friend back to church with you next week. I hope that you'll do that. And uh, anyways, hope you have a great Sunday afternoon, and we will see you next week. Have a great day. You're dismissed.